Good evening, everyone, or rather, good morning for those of you who joined us from the other side of the world, from the Northern Hemisphere and, and, and maybe elsewhere. Um, I'm Roland Bleicher. I'd like to welcome you for this uh, wonderful event. We've been very much looking forward to uh, an event with uh, Monica Degen and uh, Gillian Rose. Uh, uh, and um, before I kind of uh, introduce our guests uh, for today, couple of things we have as always we have about a half an hour conversation with our guests followed by a half an hour of an open uh, discussion and I'm delighted to have uh, my co-host today with us uh, Dr. Shreya Singh. Uh, many of you know Shreya from previous events we held. Uh, Shreya has completed her PhD uh, about half a year ago uh, on uh, on uh, an absolutely fascinating topic on th the whole politics of visualizing India's uh, nuclear tests and and how these visualizations shaped uh, national identity in in India. So we are delighted today to have with us Professor Monica Degen and Professor Julian Rose to talk about their new book, The New Urban Aesthetic: Digital Experiences of Urban Change. Uh, Monica is professor of uh, uh, urban cultural sociology at Brunel University and the author of numerous uh, works, including Sensing Cities, uh, Renegotiating Public Life in Barcelona and Manchester, as well as a range of uh, uh, top and very uh, fascinating and influential journal articles, including several in Environment and Planning D. So we're absolutely delighted to have you with us, Monica. Thank you. And we'd also like to welcome Professor Gillian Rose, who is a professor of human geography at Oxford University and one of the most influential scholars in this field, as many of you here would know. She is the author of many books, including her first one, Feminism and Geography, The Limits of Geographical Knowledge. And perhaps for most of us, the book that we know and rely on is her book on visual methods and methodologies, which is in about its fifth, I think, uh, edition today. This is perhaps the first or the second edition. I think I have a copy of every single edition somewhere at home or here, and I've been using it in my teaching for many years. I've been using it in my research, and many of us uh, have done so here too. So we have uh, uh, Monica and uh, Gillian with us to talk about uh, their new book, uh, which is um, perhaps one of the most timely books uh, one can possibly write around the extent to which our lives and especially our urban lives are becoming more and more uh, uh, dominated by digital technologies and the extent to which these digital technologies shape our sort of sensory experiments of moving around in, a, in an urban environment. Um, I just uh, came from Melbourne to, to back to Brisbane. Shreya just traveled from uh, Lucknow from her native India via Singapore to, to Brisbane and we all experienced sort of urban life and the kind of the extent to which urban life is intertwined with these digital technologies. So this is probably couldn't be more timely for a book to come out. So I was wondering if you can start off perhaps uh, with you explaining a little bit how this book came about. As often books take a long time to write, to research, and maybe you can give us a bit of background of how you decided on this topic, how it links to your work, and how you then developed your collaboration uh, on this book. Oh, I'll I'll make a start, and I wanted to thank you very much, uh, Shreya and Roland, for inviting us um, today. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to be virtually uh, with you. <laughs> so um, we basically had been uh, working together for for quite a while on several projects that investigated the engagement, you know, everyday engagements in in urban environments in Melton Keynes, for example, uh, and in Bedford. And um, in, when we were doing this, uh, we came across uh, some visualizations uh, of the redevelopment of certain areas in Bedford that sparked off really this idea of looking at uh, how digital visualizations are uh, made, but also how they are transforming um, and changing architectural practices, but moreover how they're representing future urban places and how they create a certain atmosphere, a certain feel of place in advance of, of the redevelopments. And um, yeah, we, we had an, um, a project got, you know, was sparked off 
of that then and we looked at CGIs um, in, our, in our development in Qatar and um, we analyzed how the architectural practices were changing but also how these um, CGIs in, in Qatar um, were, were really constructed thinking about the feel of place, about the sensations that this future environment that wasn't even built at the time. And these, these CGIs, the, the ones we looked at, were very much used for the branding of this future development, how they evoked sensations and, and feelings. Um, yeah, and, and we did that project then as well together. And in, I think it was Julian in 2016, 17, we sat down over coffee. And Gillian by then had started looking at smart cities, which he'll talk about in a minute. Um, and I was doing uh, my own project on, on place branding um, in, in London, et cetera. And, and yeah, we started talking, what, what are the common strands in our research? Um, you know, and, and how can we combine it in analyzing um, a, a kind of, of new emergence of, of um, new, uh, sh the, the shaping of, of, of experiences, something was changing. And especially as we mentioned in the book, we really noticed that compared to the Bedford and Milton Keynes project, where people were talking about the sensation straightforward to us, when, we, uh, when I was uh, doing the research in, in Smithfield Market, um, they kept looking at their phone and checking their phone and showing us pictures, et cetera. Um, and yeah, I'll let, um, Julian now to say so it, it 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 came out really slowly but but you know really focusing on on our um, common interests. Yeah, so um, so Monica's had this very long standing interest in um, in the sensory aspects of urban redevelopment and urban change. Uh, I've, I've always been interested in, in visual images, um, and so we converged around what well, I think were actually at that point um, in this this very sort of small, you know, kind of, I'm sure you know, nobody's heard of Bedford in the middle of, you know, kind of middle England, um, you know, but th these were watercolours of a proposed new station, I think, wasn't it, which in the yeah. end never got built. Um, but then we did this CGI project uh, together, um, and that for me pushed my interest in visuals more um, uh, so in, into more into things digital more broadly, uh, and because of course you know, I've got a very strong interest in feminist theory, I was also particularly interested in the ways in which digital technologies of many kinds actually are starting to mediate embodied urban experiences, and I think that's where we converged around the sensory as well as a particular sort of understanding of, of you know how you can think about embodiment. So we started off with this project on CGIs, and then, as Monica said, you know, a few years later, we decided because we had these shared empirical interests, we, you know, we had sufficient to start to write this book. So I, I know Monica proposed it. Um, I think uh, so. I was in the sense that I want to credit Monica with the original idea for the book. Now, now that it, you know people are saying it, it's timely, so thank you for your kind comments, Roland, and, and for this whole introduction uh, opportunity to discuss. Um, I think I would say that. Um, we then work subsequently on other projects together or, or with other collaborators. And I, I, I've been reflecting on this quite a lot because the, because the book emerged from those separate projects and its arguments were built from those particular case studies. I think now, if, if somebody said to me, you know, design a research project on the new urban aesthetic, I, I'm, I may not have chosen the same case studies, actually. Um, I, I think I, or, or maybe the same places, but we would have asked perhaps different questions, maybe adopted some different research methods. So that, uh, this might be something to, uh, you know, perhaps to discuss later. Um, but I think, you know, it, 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 because it was, it was quite a lot of work to try and sort of conceptually cohere, cohere these distinct projects into what I hope is a fairly, uh, you know, together statement in the, in the book, a kind of framework, a kind of analytical framework, which is really what we want the book to do, uh, is, is to offer a, a conceptual way of understanding this thing that we've labeled the new, the new urban aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Now we've got quite a 
few things we keen to explore further that you already mentioned, the three case studies. I know that Treya is very keen to kind of explore the sensory dimensions, the visual dimensions. But did you want to say a few words maybe about why you use this term, the new urban aesthetic, as kind of the, the anchoring for your book and how it's linked to social political aspects, not just sensory and, and kind of visual, but to the political aspects of, of that, maybe, as for those of you who kind of, um, for those online who sort of have just come to the book? Well, for us, the, the sensory is political, or at least for me, I'll, I'll talk for me, yeah. um, and the visual as well, of course. So, um, like, what what um, what I've been really interested in, in in my career since, you know, my, my, my PhD is really this uh, notion of aesthetics in urban redevelopments, and the way I've understood this aesthetics and, and and we also then developed it then further was that the um aesthetics um, can be by now really and un be understood as this emphasis on the sensory look and feel and and the design of urban environments and it's been you know it's been really for me become a really important way of of looking at the link between the political and the everyday um and how you know, um, broader um, trends are reflected in everyday life and, and um, affecting the, the everyday life of, of residents. And what, what's, what we really noticed um, and why we wanted to, to write a book is that much of this kind of aestheticizing work is now um, uh, conducted using digital technologies. And, and it's really this mediation of urban aesthetic experience by digital technologies um, of, of very many different kinds that can be described as we, we think as this new urban aesthetic. And, and what we were really keen to emphasize is that it's not a static thing, that the, there isn't one um, new urban aesthetic. There are many different configurations in different um, places that crystallize very differently across the globe. And that's why we were quite keen to have three different case studies in three different forms of urban redevelopment. Um, um, Milton Keynes was retrofitting um, the city uh, as a smart city. Um, Qatar was a grant, uh, a, a mega regeneration, like, yeah, building from scratch, like a um, regeneration program. And uh, Smithfield Market is a cultural uh, regeneration um, strategy. So we were really keen to have these to, to show across geographies and different cultures how this concept travels and how it can be used to analyze something that's new, emerging, you know, as we speak at the moment in, in, in neighborhoods as well. So each city will have within it different um, new urban aesthetics happening depending on the redevelopments in different places. So like I guess in terms of that. oh sorry, I was just, in, <laughs> so in terms of, of, of the sort of politics more broadly, I, I guess from you know, from what Monica said, there are a lot of quite different sorts of, of kind of formal political organizations of one kind or another that we are sort of the background really to the argument because I think that you know there's a lot of work that's looked at you know for example uh, you know state sponsored gentrification or the, you know these kind of related issues um, there's also a lot of work in geography that looks at the platform economies that sorry the political economies of what's being called you know, platform urbanism so the way in which um, the, the harvesting of data from social media use is, is commodified and there's a whole kind of political economy uh, to that. But, but you'll have gathered, but you know, we were interested in a different kind of politics, I guess. And I think one that probably, you know, we felt deserved more attention, which is this kind of embodied sensorial politics with a small p, I suppose, the way, the way power dynamics work out through, through these everyday sensations. Lots of interesting threads to pick up from there, Gillian and Monica. And I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to start with this one. Um, you discuss, and Monica mentioned, you know, when you're discussing Milton Keynes, you talk about how it's been brand branded or rather retrofitted as a smart city. And you see terms like this, and even I see it as I go about, you know, in different spaces of connected city, resilient city, even like um, 
a smart village, which somehow is an oxymoron, but somehow works also, and intelligent communities and so on and so forth. And these terms are sort of bandied about quite willy-nilly almost. So what do you think is different about this new digital branding strategy almost that we're seeing now? Okay, so I'll I'll, I'll start on that one, uh, which is a great question. And I think you're absolutely right to flag the fact that not, um, not all of this is new. Uh, so I guess our use of the word new, uh, um, you know, we should have said sort of almost or partly or, you know, quite a bit or something before it in brackets. Um, so I think uh, a lot of the straightforward kind of branding and marketing uh, um, that, that, it, that is now done using digitally produced images uh, in, in many ways is actually not that different from the kind of branding and place marketing that I guess many you know urban scholars have been familiar with and, and have criticized you know for you know, for decades uh, around its kind of selectivity and partiality uh, and so on and I certainly think that you know you're right to pick up on this idea of the digital in very you know platform smart you know all being again used so frequently they almost become these kind of empty signifiers and all they mean is kind of, you know, sort of desirable, trendy, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, in, in specifically in terms of branding, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. I think other aspects of our argument are, are more distinctly digital and we might come on to that, I think, later in the conversation. Nonetheless, I think even in the context of branding, I think there are some differences that it's gone digital now. One of which is that I think the style of images is now different. Um, certainly the very expensive kind of high-end ones you know, really strive very hard for a kind of sort of glamorous photorealism. And, and I think potentially that does make them more, maybe more realistic. Um, certainly some of the architects we talked to said they were very invested in these CGIs because they felt they communicated what they wanted to build to clients better than um, kind of plans and sections, you know, the kind of more technical drawings that architects would otherwise use, which they felt a lot of um, clients you know, wouldn't, didn't have the skills to, to, to understand. Um, so, you know, maybe the content a bit glossier, but, you know, maybe not that different. I think though that once that content goes online, you know, whether that's on a you know, architect's website or on a, you know, a branding campaign website or a developer's website, it can, you know, get copied, downloaded, and it's, it can start to circulate online. Uh, and I think what that allows for is, well, is a much wider distribution and a much, therefore, wider visibility for a lot of these projects. And I think I've certainly, uh, you know, even on my kind of rather random presence on, on social media, you know, picked up on that does give a lot wider range of people and organizations an opportunity to comment and react back to some of these proposals and I think certainly I'm, I'm getting a sense that there's a bit more of a sort of cynicism now around a lot of these very glossy images and you know you can see people sort of on Twitter kind of you know verbally rolling their eyes at them and kind of you know even taking you know and taking the piss out of them you know, on occasion um, so there's a lot more circulation of images. I think the other thing is that branding is now also becoming accompanied by a much more kind of user generated place image making kind of um, uh, energy, let's say, uh, where you know everyday users of, of, of you know Instagram, Facebook are posting about their urban experiences, and 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 particularly when they're going to some of these places that have been branded, kind of their views are kind of engaging with what the brand has wanted, and you're becoming you know influencers are becoming very important branders in their own right, um, uh, you know quite apart, often distinct from from more formal marketing campaigns. Um, so I think while some of the core imagery is not that different. I think the way it gets distributed and then bound up into uh, the, the dynamics of social media itself, I think that is something that is quite new and distinctive. And the uh, branding campaigns, I think, are now having to grapple with, which I think is something uh, yeah, Monica um, might, might want to say a little bit about. I don't, I don't know. Well, I just very briefly, I mean, yes, so I agree with everything Julian said, but um, it's also that uh, the, the performance of branding is now in your hand. Um, you carry it with you and you take images while you're walking around the city and you become part of the branding process, um, anyone who's got a smartphone, etc. So I think it, branding is being, I, I, I read quite a bit of marketing on branding, place branding literature for the book, like it's being reconfigured basically. Um, and, and yeah, um, it is actually also deeply changing the, the shape of the city. We could argue it always has, of course, um, but um, you know, we all now 
well, I don't know about Australia because I haven't been, as I mentioned, but, you know, in London, in Barcelona, in Europe, you have now Instagrammable uh, moments on, on streets that are designed by the city council or by shops, by retail to, to be on the ground. Um, and it's really reshaping the physicality of the urban environment. Could we maybe discuss a bit more the, the sensory dimensions uh, of all that, in a sense that this really seems very keen to your book, how people uh, sensory in, in an emotional way experience the urban environment, living in it. I look at my notes here from reading your book, and one of the key questions you ask is, what does it feel like to inhabit urban spaces mediated by digital devices? And you sort of say this is very much a... Um, uh, um, an embodied experience, an embodied encounter with the screen and the emotions. And, and to me, sort of one of the interesting questions that raises is a methodological question. So it might be to both of you, because I know, Monica, you deal with the sensory dimension and Gillian is a person who's done a lot of work on methods. One of the challenges with, with examining emotions and affect is that they inherently bodily sensations. So we feel them in our bodies, but they, in that sense, they're quite personal. They're, they're, they're you know, they're difficult to understand because we can't sort of speak, we can speak about our emotions, but we can only feel them in our bodies. So how do you deal with that kind of challenge of understanding how emotions and affect shape this digital experience in, in the city? How have you sort of grappled with that? Um, I'll, I'll make a start and then Julian will, <laughs> um, um, will continue. So, um, I mean, for me, it's been quite important in my career to to very to to make clear that that the first step is to understand sensory experience not just as a subjective individual experience, but to understand the evaluation how we evaluate the sensory when we perceive as a socially and and culturally constructed um, um, perception of things, but that is socially, you know, shaped and, and um, we, we sense, I mean, historically, um, you know, a lot of different people have written about it. Also, um, David House, Richard Sennett, of how um, historically there are certain sensory ideologies shaping um, how uh, we evaluate um, what which smells we like, um, what associations we might have, um, how we might find certain sensations appealing or repellent, and whether we associate them also with certain social groups um, or good or bad taste. So the senses are, are not just, I would argue, and emotions. They are, the, the emotions that they evoke are not just subjective, but there are also some hegemonic kind of sensory ideologies um, in different cultures at different time periods in, in different societies. So, so if we go from that point of view that there are certain hegemonic or dominant ways of, of sensing, um, and then, um, then we, we also want to understand what is being sensed and what not, and how are these ideologies constructed? And I think the book is trying to get to that now in our digital times and, and also in our kind of um, you know, neoliberal urbanism kind of, of times where style and looks uh, matter so much. And there's a certain fashion in urban designer of a you know, certain kind of of design um, um, aesthetics that, that are promoted across the globe and across cities. So methodologically, um, research then into a sense that I have always argued and, and in my, on my different websites, I, I think I show it, um, needs to be multi-method. Um, and uh, I have developed different toolkits to do so, um, but um, coming from spe especially the projects we did together with um, the architectural practices, uh, um, for example, I think it's really important to think about how, you know, environments and the, these sensations are conceived. Um, and then perceived and lived, Le Lefebvre's trialectic. Um, so we would, we suggest in the book to look at the different aesthetic uh, labors uh, on, you know, on, on, on multiple sites that need to be analyzed. So how is, how are 
the sen you know our sensations constructed <laughs> would be one way of of looking at that but then on the ground um you also need multiple methods um from you know vox pox um which i know is verbal but um i've tried more recently last year um emotional mapping of places um, by um, asking people to um, um, create poems um, of uh, of their feelings of of, an, of a high street etc for example um, or to describe you know a place through a color rather than through the you know the, the ordinary kind of language but think if you had to describe i don't know your neighborhood in a color what color would it be and why and I don't know, like the, there's still so much to explore, but I, I really think it's important to to tap into those, like you say, the connection between the sensory and the emotional um, through uh, various methodologi method methodologies uh, and methods and, and to think both of the construction um, and the experience um, of, of the sensory. Uh, Gillian, um. Yeah, I just um, briefly add uh, w one reason the book is actually very careful to avoid the use of the term affect actually is because um, yeah. we could have called it the new urban affect, but, you know, in a way. Uh, for, uh, but Roland, as you say, you know, obviously aff affect is actually, I think, very, you know, to be theoretically consistent is very hard to, to, to get at. In theory, it's impossible to get at. So uh, so the, the word affect, I hope, doesn't appear anywhere in the manuscript. It might have slipped in in one or two places. But, um, but I would also say just to so Monica, absolutely, there are loads of different methods, creative methods, speculative methods, but I think because of that sense that we're looking at something that is not purely individually subjective, but something that's kind of collectively subjective, looking at the, the common themes that emerge across you know, different voices, different words, different visuals and so on, I, I think that that was something we tried to pick out, you know, um, something that, that was you know, appeared more in more than one place, if from more than one source, you know, to get at that sense that this is a kind of so, this is a sort of social, socially mediated process. Uh, Monica, you mentioned a bit about the sensory when you're talking about the sensory experiences. You also mentioned the not so pleasant uh, sensory experiences, and I want to pick up on that. You both have done three case studies, two in the UK and one in Doha, and one in so uh, and they're very different spaces. And of course, the Doha and Qatar being very timely because the World Cup does sort of highlight what you essentially write about in your book, where it's an effort to sell a place, to attract investment, and to do so through these performative interventions, almost through computer-generated images in the case of Doha. So I'm wondering, you're talking about all the glitz and the glamour and everything about uh, sensory experiences. Uh, what about the multi-sensory experiences that are not as pleasant? You know, how do you account or in methodologically or otherwise, how do you convey and reconcile, you know, like the heat in Doha or the massive inequities in Qatar, which have been really brought to light or the foul smells of the rains in the UK? Like, how do you reconcile all of those aspects? <laughs> Yeah, no, that that's that's a really uh, you know in, interesting question, and um, and and clearly you know the the CGI's in particular. I mean, um, and I think this is where you know they're, they're quite a difficult thing to pull off successfully now because you know when you look at them, when we look at them, you know we know that as exactly as you just said, you know that this is not actual multi sensory urban experience. It's a very um, it's a cleaned up version, uh, you know, according to certain versions of what's clean and what's not. Um, uh, it, it, there are no smells, there are no sounds, um, and I think as, as more work is emerging, kind of interrogating what, what we call the new urban aesthetic, one of the things that is becoming evident, I think, is that some of those other sensory sensations, experiences, are ways in which um, some of these more uh, kind of branding, marketing kinds of aesthetics are being challenged. So, for example, Brandy Summers in a really sustained uh, look at how a particular neighborhood in Washington DC is being gentrified and how, as she says, the sort of visual signifiers of, of black coolness are replacing actual black businesses and black bodies in, in this neighborhood at, through gentrification. She suggests that one of the ways that black communities are pushing back there is by playing very loud music, black, black strongly signifying black music. Um, yeah, so so there are ways in which uh, you know these aesthetics can can be multiple and can contest each other, and I think some shifting away from the visual can be one way in which that that happens. 
Um, but I think, you know, nonetheless, the visual remains important. I think that's why we wanted to move beyond the kind of place branding argument as well, because there's a lot more, a lot, a lot more other kinds of digital mediations going on. Um, and the, the particular um, project that I've worked on, looking at a lot of smart city um, work, uh, uh, innovations in, in Milton Keynes in the UK, what, what really struck me there was that although, you know, you're looking at screens, so in one sense it's visual, actually the assumption in a lot of these smartphone apps is that what the screen is doing to you is delivering you information with the correct data that will then enable you to move through the city effectively so it's a kind of um that's a more sort of kinetic mo mobility that's being invited or induced uh you know it's through through these screens um so i i think uh although the visual i think is is dominant i would say um it's certainly not it doesn't monopolize what, what goes on in terms of digital mediations and i think audio would be a really interesting thing to explore more in this context um uh, sonic sonic geographies is a thing um and maybe you know perhaps as the technologies develop you know and they are rapidly continuing to do so uh you know maybe when we're all in the metaverse there will also be you know touch and, and, and other kinds of sensory things that are mediated digitally so um i, th I think this is very very fast moving area actually room for lo lots lots more research that might touch on those kind of more multi-sensory multi-sensory aspects yeah look these are all really Fascinating questions. And in fact, I just saw that Michelle Weitzel joined us from Geneva and she works on the sonic dimensions of, <laughs> of politics. That's precisely the kind of issues he talked about. Now, we want to kind of open it up for everyone, but I was wondering if I can first ask you, maybe uh, uh, each of you, Monica and Julian, for some final reflections, perhaps on coming back to the visual dimensions again, because we have visual uh, politics research group, and obviously. The visual has always been part of our lives, part of part of urban lives. That's not new, but there's still a new dimension, as you call it in your in your title, in the sense that we have the visual in smartphones everywhere, but you, we also have it on billboards. We have it on consoles, as you say. My 20 year old car broke down last week, so I was test driving a new car this morning, and this is all about visuals. There's screens everywhere, and our experiences are so much mediated by these. Uh, can you say a few final words, perhaps, before we open up on perhaps how these visuals also link to power relationships and to how we kind of experience in a city, how we live a city politically? Uh, I, I let go, Gillian go first, or, or do you want to <laughs> I don't know, up to you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I guess, so I, I think uh, Monica and I are now looking at, I think, um, set sort of uh, taking more of our own individual directions, I think, at, at this point around these sorts of topics. And, and I am actually particularly interested in the, the where this digital visualization is going, because I do think there is something distinctive about digital visuality. Um, although it, it has, it often mimics these very long histories of what we think of as images, you know, photo, in, particularly around photorealism. So even the most you know, amazing Hollywood movie visual effects, which are almost entirely digitally generated, you know, still have to look real in some way, in the way that we are used to seeing, thinking of the real through, through analog uh, camera technologies. Um, but I think increasingly uh, the um, malleability, the, 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 the quality of sort of circulation, and also increasingly the way algorithms are starting to embed into the production of, of real time visual imagery is something that's really, uh, you know, needs a lot more attention. And actually, um, I don't know if your what capabilities your car had for of self driving, but you know, increasingly we are being joined by objects in the in the urban environment that 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 well, see, but they certainly navigate urban spaces spatially on their own, you know, delivery robots, self-driving cars, you know, there, there's going to be so much more of that in the future. Um, we're also seeing uh, techniques for modelling um, traffic and, and uh, urban crowds, urban security, surveillance being generated by uh, machine like video cameras, surveillance cameras in, in so entirely, um, this is agent based modeling, entirely digitally based visuals and, and um, uh, simulations of, of human behavior in cities. 
um, you know, immersive experiences, 3D digital billboards, you know, this whole area is kind of really exploding. Uh, and I think a lot of these things are only possible through digital digital technologies. The visual is really being reconfigured. And, and I'm, I'm certainly for the next year or so, that, that's what I absolutely want to be thinking very hard about. Because um, I, I think something really quite radical is afoot uh, in, in, in visual culture more generally, actually. Um, but I suspect uh, Monica may bring it a bit more materially back down to urban and how, how people are experiencing all of this. Monica, what, what do you think? Well, no, the, the last point that, that Gillian made is, is, I guess, what I've been thinking more and more, that the, the visual is being reconfigured through the other senses. And, um, you know, it, 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 like by now, um, all these branding campaigns, um, uh, and 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 I guess it's not just um, the, the on on social media, but also in like I said, retail spaces or cities that they're really thinking across the visual and the feeling, the the atmospheres of these places as not just visual but embodied and multi sensory. Um, so I think we were really keen in the book to really um, to to push forward and we're now um, writing an article together on really crystallizing the power relations much more that are emerging from this reconfiguration um, of, of, of you know, the visual, the sensory, the embodied in, in cities. And we're, we're thinking of power and I've learned a lot from Gillian, you know, thinking like more like that because um, initially I, I thought, you know, I, I, I thought of power very much as you know, impinging on on people and you know, top down. But but there are also all these resistant, not even resistances, but alternative ways of experiencing in cities and coming. You know, ignoring um, um, branding campaigns and and I think maybe there's also forms of of um, yeah um, subversion etc going on within social media that we haven't even detected yet i mean what we really wanted to to suggest in this book is that the three case studies and our three examples of the new urban aesthetics which were we defined as glamour flow and drama um are just the start of us of many more that we hope other scholars you know um listening on and across the world um will 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 research and and discover um and and tell us more about so we hope that you know um there will be different inflections of the new urban aesthetic being um researched in in across locations on the globe and i'm i'm we're really keen on learning and hearing more from from other scholars about their thoughts and their research great well look thank you so much uh, uh, to both of you uh, monica and julian for the interview part of this and